Hello. How are you this morning? It's still the morning for you, isn't it? It is the morning. We're gathering up folks. I think we're starting to, uh, we're probably listening to our conversation, which is fantastic. Uh, some familiar faces and uh, some folks, some new folks, which is lovely. New, new recruits, new people that join the, the tribe, join the circle. That is great. What's the weather like in Burgundy? Uh, it rained for the first time in uh, five weeks today. So that's, uh, wow. that's good. That's very unusual to have no rain all the way through March. Yes, incredible. Just to, uh, as people are confined, you know, the weather has been absolutely great, gorgeous, and everybody wanted to go out. But of course, nobody could. So it was, uh, it was uh, really a, a, a temptation that was uh, really big and hard to resist. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's see, how many folks do we have? Uh, greetings, Eric. Eric Brooks says, hello. Welcome back. Hello. Um, we are getting up there. We got another, got about 60% of the folks on. We can... Um, I see somebody, I've seen somebody from Italy. So, greetings. Yeah, um, Burgundy. That's uh, great. You're you're there. All right. Let's see, Italy. Well, I see folks from California. I see uh, Mark coming in from the Berkshires, I believe. Uh, folks from Chicago. Few folks from Chicago. It's great. An entire contingent. We got a New York City contingent coming in, people that are at the absolute epicenter okay. of this, uh, this pandemic. Jesus. What more fun it will bring. Hopefully everybody's healthy. So we're, uh, we're over 12 o'clock, uh, or actually, yeah, 12 o'clock, nine o'clock for you. Have you already eaten? Oh yes, of course. I'm starving, you know, uh, at this time of, uh, of the day. I cannot wait uh, two more hours to eat. Yeah, I've what eaten what and drink? drunk. I drunk. I think we're going to speak about that. Ah, oh, okay. So you you warmed up with that. Yeah, I haven't even opened my bottles yet. Yes. I figured I'd do that and things. So I guess we can get started. Um, welcome everybody. A little in, impromptu chit chat there with John Nickel and I. We do talk to each other every day, but. Well, actually a lot on video lately. Um, this is our mm -hmm. third webinar in uh, an ongoing se series. Uh, we appreciate your participation. Uh, Lord knows there's an awful lot of Zooming going on out there and a ton of webinars. I actually saw an art webinar this morning with an artist who brought us into their studio and did a very similar kind of thing. Um, this is the way that we are, are making community these days and people with shared interests and, and shared ideals. But this is, uh, this is uh, the Nicola J. Mayo Camise uh, circle and we're very pleased to have you, very pleased to have you. And today is Chardonnay, something that is not as new for uh, Jean Nicola, but for Nicola J. is very, very new. Yes, uh, and I say guten Abend uh, to the friends in uh, in Germany. And um, yes, it's uh, it's an interesting topic for for us because uh, uh, you may wonder what do these two guys know about Chardonnay? After all, they 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 make mostly red wine. They make red wine, and they come from regions where it's uh, mostly red wine. Côte de Nuit is almost totally red. And Oregon is 70% Pinot Noir. So are we legitimate? What do we know about Chardonnay? Um, and we'll, 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 we'll find out. I'm not sure we know much, but we'll, we'll say what we know. And we'll talk about what we know. And the fun of making Chardonnay. 
Exactly. And before you go, you dive into that, Jean-Nicolas, let me uh, point out, those of you that got the bundles, uh, this is the uh, Bishop Creek 2017 Chardonnay. Notice the groovy little thing on the top. Those of you that are familiar with the Nicolas J branding sequence will recognize the layout, except this is green. We have green, and, and yes, it's true. Those with a, a keen eye will notice that the color of green for the uh, foil is an identical ripoff of the Clos Saint Philibert and the green used by Mayo Camise. So a little subtle connection, and that'll be a trivia question at some point in your life. You'll be the only one who will be able to nail that. But we have the 17 Bishop Creek, and we have the 2000 18 Affinite. Both of these are new releases, in fact, fairly unreleased, other than those of you that are on this, this webinar. And we'll be opening the, these for the first time today and tasting them with you. Um, but I think all I wanted to say, show you the bottles and then say, if you aren't already drinking, please pull your cork. I'm going to do that uh, as well. So we don't, you don't have to wait until we get to the tasting portion of this to start drinking. Of course. Of course. All right, so uh, perhaps a few words on, on Chardonnay. And let's start with the, uh, with the beginning. That is, Chardonnay was, was born in Burgundy. There is actually a small village in the, in the saône loire near Macon, which is called Chardonnay. And uh, the origin of Chardonnay has been mysterious for um, quite some time, although it comes from Burgundy, but it was mistaken for a form of Pinot for a lot of time, for a long, very long time. Uh, some people, you know, um, in the 19th and early 20th century, it was found that it was different from, uh, from Pinot, that it was not just another member or a full member of the Pinot family. It was not uh, Pinot Blanc. Uh, but uh, really, the, the, the origin may, uh, remained mysterious. And um, when uh, it was possible to do uh, uh, research on, on genes, is, which is very recently, so in the last 20 years, Chardonnay was one of the um, um, uh, grape variety first um, analyzed. And the results were quite, um, quite interesting. Because Chardonnay has, found, has been found to be a cross of Pinot Noir and uh, Goué, which is a white grape, totally forgotten these days, and of very low quality. So it is very interesting to see that um, actually it's like uh, the uh, the breeding and uh, the marriage between a prince uh, with a really low, 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 low class and even a, a, a whore, let's say, because Gwe is really not, not good. So it's very interesting to see that this uh, combination and this marriage got uh, that result and that um, I guess we have the distinction and the class of the people Pinot Noir, and the generosity of uh, the Gué uh, grape variety. Um, otherwise, we can say a word about Chardonnay in, uh, in Burgundy before, uh, Jay, you say a word about Chardonnay in Oregon. And I think we have a map of uh, Burgundy to show you uh, at some point. Yes, great. Um, so, uh, what is important to, um, to really realize and to understand, first of all, is that uh, uh, Burgundy is, is massively white. It's 60% white. Because when you count Chablis to the north and Macon to the south, which are ex almost exclusively uh, white uh, wine uh, regions, of course, it makes a big, uh, uh, a big impression, a big impact. Of course, you have also uh, the Côte de Beaune. And the Côte de Nuit would be almost an exception in Burgundy because it's, it's massively red. Uh, but uh, the rest of Burgundy is massively, massively white. And of course, you have uh, 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 really more than 100 kilometers and, and <coughs> 100 and 
and, and 50 kilometers uh, difference between Chablis and, and, and Macon, which is north, north to south, which is of course uh, very big. And therefore, um, you can imagine that these wines are very, very, very different from uh, one another. Chablis, as most of you know, is, is, is a region where yeah, the wines, the whites are very dry, whereas in Macon, uh, further south and towards Lyon, uh, Macon, the whites are more generous, more viscous, uh, uh, and um, have um, and are less uh, less lean and upright and are more generous and sometimes a bit soft and of course we tend to think here in the Côte d'Or we're in the middle of Burgundy but we tend to think in the Côte d'Or that we have a good uh, uh, synthesis of the two and uh, uh, arguably the best uh, the best balance in terms of uh, in terms of Chardonnay. If you do say so yourself. I recognize I'm a little biased. Um, <laughs> for good reason, for good reason. Okay, so this is, this is the picture, the bright picture in, in Burgundy. And maybe, Jay, you can talk about what is the picture of, um, of Chardonnay in Oregon. Yes, so um, Oregon has a, uh, only more recently been sort of known for, for Chardonnay. But the truth is, is that the Chardonnay grape was planted there at the very beginning. In fact, David Lett, who uh, started Irie and who has the, the uh, uh, absolutely deserved reputation for starting the wine uh, business in Oregon, in 1965, he actually planted Chardonnay alongside the Pinot Gris and the Pinot Noir that he planted at that time. Um, those cuttings came from Napa, they were what are called the Wente clone. It was actually the same uh, uh, cuttings or the same clones that were planted at Stony Hill and uh, Souverain, which were the uh, sort of preeminent Chardonnay producers in California at the time. Um, the, the reputation of Oregon Chardonnay in the 70s, 80s, and even in the 90s was that of being inconsistent. I mean, I know I bought a fair amount and drank a fair amount of Oregon Chardonnay during those times. And there were certainly some fantastic ones and there were some that were not. And there's some controversy in terms of why that was. Uh, Robert Parker, who many of you know, invested in Beaufrere at the very early on with his uh, brother-in-law, I believe was the connection there. He uh, was accused of uh, nepotism when he was writing very glowing reviews about the not only the Pinot Noir coming from Oregon, but the Chardonnay uh, in 1980. In fact, in 1985, he wrote a whole thing about how these uh, Oregon Chardonnays are challenging Burgundy and so on and so forth, which was quite controversial. But the reason why this inconsistency happened in Oregon for Chardonnay, it really depends on who you talk to. Um, some people say it had to do with the high yields. Um, and the, the late ripening characteristic of the clone, and some people talk about the clones. Uh, other people talk about the fact that the winemakers, the, the vineyard owners, were not thinning the crop and they were not reducing the crop and therefore there was a lot of um, uh, uh, impact there obviously in terms of concentration. Others say it was because they were using too much oak and, and that, that greater amount of oak and toastiness was what was influencing the Chardonnay and making it uh, the end product come out as not being distinctive and extraordinary. Certainly there were good Chardonnays all the way through that period. And Jason Lett uh, is quoted, and I wanna, don't wanna misquote him as saying, Oregon, Oregon Chardonnay was always good when made by people who understood Chardonnay. And uh, a, a less politically correct way of saying that is the people that knew how to farm Chardonnay and the people that know how to make Chardonnay were making good Chardonnay. And the people who, were, who do not, were not. Um, and I, I guess it just really depends on, on your perspective. But my guess is, is that uh, my opinion would be is that Jason is correct. Um, the Dijon clones arrived uh, at OSU in 1988. Um, it was actually David Alzheimer. David Alsheim, who sort of facilitated that when he was over in Burgundy. Um, but they were not really planted in earnest until the early 90s, 93 to 95. Um, they became popular because they ripened earlier. That was the, one of the things that people talked about. And again, that was one of the excuses people used as to why some of the wines weren't turning out as well as they, they would have liked. 
1987, there was about 733 acres of Chardonnay, and there were 900, just over 900 acres of Pinot Noir. So shockingly uh, equal. I mean, not far off in terms of the size of the plantings. In 2018, there were 1,940 acres of Chardonnay planted, and there were 16,500 acres of Pinot Noir planted in Oregon. So dramatic uh, uh, differences, and you can really see how the popularity and the success and the accolades that have been coming in on a consistent basis for the Pinot Noir coming out of Oregon impacted the planning decisions in terms of what everybody, everybody did. One other thing in terms of all my talking to people and researching and so forth, that, that one of the other reasons why people said some of the earlier Chardonnays weren't as good as some of them that are coming out now was the locations in terms of where the plantings were. People were tended to give the sort of prime locations to the Pinot Noir and then they'd sort of throw some Chardonnay in. And that obviously is not going to be a, a, a solution to that uh, in terms of making the very, very best. Um, one of the things that uh, jean nicole and I uh, have talked about much, and certainly all the tasting that he and I've done across Burgundy, and um, we can probably lose this slide, actually. We've been looking at this thing for a long time. Yeah, but now you can look at us I mean, while we're, while we're talking. Um, but one of the, the things that we've talked about a lot is that uh, in Burgundy, there's a real consistency within the regions or within the Appalachians in the sense that Chablis really has a consistency, even among the different producers. And not to say that there's not a difference between Davaso or, 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 or um, Ravenel, but it, it really tastes like Ch Chablis. And the same in Merceau and some of the other regions. But in Oregon, that's not really the case. Um, Dundee Hills, you can have a Chardonnay from one producer in Dundee Hills and another producer in Dundee Hills, and the, and the wines taste remarkably different, even though they're from obviously the same terroir and for arguably somewhat the same site, although not exactly the same site. So there is not the same consistency among the wines that you get from whether it's Eola Amity, uh, McMinnville, or, or the Dundee Hills. And um, that's something that we'll see what happens if that starts to develop. I mean, obviously, I mean, Jean Nicola, they've been making white Burgundy for how long? Since... I've been making uh, I've been making uh, the, uh, the the Clos Saint Philibert since 1992. But you're a baby. I mean, that's 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 I mean, in the scheme of things, yes. they've been making white Burgundy for as long as Pinot Noir. Or um... oh yes, oh yes, yes, yes. Especially considering that everything was mixed before. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So um, that's really it on the, on the, on the Oregon history, but uh, certainly the, uh, the accolades that are coming in now for, for Oregon Chardonnay is, is quite extraordinary. And uh, it's, 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 um, as I travel around the country and talk with Psalms and, 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 and our partners at the, at the wine shops, people are really looking for Oregon Chardonnay. And there's a lot of interest out there in terms of uh, of, of tasting it. And there's a sense that this is, is really coming on a, as a region and something that, who knows, 20 years from now, you may see a very different mix in terms of the plantings as well as the reputation for Oregon, which up until this point has been primarily about Pinot Noir. Absolutely. At least at the high end. Right. All right. Yeah. Okay. So um, with um, uh, We've planted uh, the picture, so to speak, uh, and uh, now I believe we're going to see our plantation. We get to see Tracy. Yes. He's going to join us. Hi, I'm Tracy Kendall, associate winemaker for Nicholas J and Boots on the Ground here in Oregon. Uh, welcome to Bishop Creek Vineyard. This is our estate vineyard out in Yamhill Carlton. Uh, just to orient you, you're looking pretty much South Valley, right? Straight down the beautiful, yeah, um, beautiful Willamette Valley to the south. Uh, to the west is the coastal range, right? So kind of straight out to the coast there. If you were here with me, perhaps you can see in my hair, there's a fair amount of wind. Um, we always have wind up here at the top of the hill. It's coming in off that coastal range, so keeping the site nice and cool, really cool at night. 
Uh, we're up at about 750 feet in elevation here at the top. This is an old vine Pinot Gris block that we actually top grafted to Chardonnay. So this is all the production that we're getting right now for Bishop Creek Chardonnay is this block planted in 1998 and the block right below us that was planted in 2000. Uh, we took a gamble, right, to top graft onto Chardonnay because we'd never had Chardonnay off of Bishop Creek before. We get a lot of beautiful old vine own rooted Pinot Noir that's down at the bottom of the hill. Um, and we knew that the Pinot Gris coming off the site was gorgeous, but we didn't really know how Chardonnay would perform. Uh, one of the reasons we took the chance to do top grafting and to undertake that challenge was because of some of the characters that are coming out in the Pinot Noir. Right, these are all ancient marine sediment soils, and one thing that you get from these soils is a lot of minerality, both in the Pinot Noir and now we're seeing the Chardonnay. Um, and I think that's a character that uh, all of Nicholas Jay, you know, jean Nicolas Jay, myself, are really looking for in Chardonnays that we make, is that pure sort of fruit intensity, that minerality, that crispness, that freshness, while still having a fair amount of weight and texture and body. And again, the Pinot Noir certainly show that, um, and so the excitement and the hope was that we'd see that in the Chardonnay. We're now in our third year of Chardonnay production, so we got our first um, batch in 17, a pretty full production in 18, and again in 19, and we're seeing year in and year out just beautiful texture, beautiful mouthfeel, a lot of crisp sort of wet stone minerality, um, and gorgeous fruit. So it's turned out to be a beautiful site. Um, we're really excited to see how the vines age. We've planted a new vineyard block just below me, or in sort of the corner there, which is um, Young Vine Chardonnay and should be in production a little bit this year and for sure by next year. So we'll continue to see increasing production here at Bishop Creek in the Chardonnay. Great. Thank you, Tracy. <laughs> Lovely, Tracy. Lovely. And uh, you know, uh, I wish I was. I wish I was in, uh, in Oregon, and I wish I could. Uh, I could go because this is a, a beautiful site. Yeah, yeah. I'm. I'm anxious to see uh, how the uh, the the new plantings uh, are are you know reacting mm -hmm. now that mm -hmm. things happen in Bud Break. Uh, those of you that are following us on Instagram have seen the photos of Bud Break uh, there in Oregon. Mm -hmm. and, and we're off to the races, as they say. The, the 2020 season is is begun. It has begun, and it's, it's really looking beautiful. Mm -hmm. So you are. Um, I think we're now going to talk about the wines, right? We're going to talk about the uh, the the, the Nicolas wines. Um, again, uh, where Tracy was standing is where these wines came from, for the most part. The affinity uh, is is a blend. So there's some uh, some wines from. Uh, one other site, but but for the most part, most all the wine you have in your glass comes from Bishop Creek, from the site that you just saw, from those very vineyards. Um, the Chardonnay, uh, the Bishop Creek Chardonnay was the 17 was the very first uh, Chardonnay and white wine that we had pulled off the site. Um, the Pinot Gris that had been grown there in the past, we sold. Um, most all of it to Marcus Goodfellow, who makes uh, was making a fantastic Pinot Gris from it, and was most disappointed in us that we decided to do the grafting over to the Chardonnay at the beginning of 2015. But you are um, you're tasting the results in your glass. Uh, the 17 we made very 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 small quantities uh, as the uh, plants when, when when you graft you have to basically stop the fruit from uh, uh, allowing it to grow any uh, uh, grapes in the, for the first two years. In 2015 and 2016, you literally cut them off and have all of their energy go into the, the healing of that, that cut. I mean, it's literally a cut when they, when they graft. I mean, a chainsaw, like <laughs> cutting the whole thing off, which is quite not only traumatic to the plant, but was traumatic for us. To see, to see that actually happening. Mm -hmm. um, but those first two years, there was no fruit uh, uh, grown. And then in 17, we let it grow a little bit. Uh, did we have, was it a structure, jean Nicolas? Was it, it was not even one cluster per shoot, was it? It was less than that. Yes, it was, it was, uh, it was very low because of course uh, the shoots are quite, uh, quite small and uh, you want to, uh, the uh, the leaves to develop, but you don't necessarily want to have uh, a, a lot of uh, a lot of fruit the first year. Yeah, exactly. And we ended up with um, I don't want to misquote. Yeah, less than um, 
Well, a whopping 55 cases of this wine is what, what, what we made. So it was really more of a, of a, of a first go, but um, the wine is drinking great. And unfortunately, John Nicola does not have this wine in front of him, in front of this. So this is- no, a, there was, uh, there was uh, not enough for France. I was left behind. But uh, the uh, actually, the actually the uh, that was a first a first trial um, and uh, actually the really the first let's say that was year zero the first year one was in uh, 2018 when we had uh, uh, much closer to a, a normal crop. And uh, um, 2018 is really good vintage in Oregon, combining uh, ripeness and, uh, uh, and texture and acidity and freshness. So it shows in Pinot, and with Pinots uh, being a little uh, a little tight. But in Chardonnay, it's really the balance is really beautiful because you have this richness and this tension at the same time. And um, I was I was really uh, I was really uh, amazed and uh, extremely excited with the result of uh, the Chardonnay in, in eighteen. So I'm 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 really excited at uh, at showing it and selling it because I uh, I really love the wine in in eighteen. And this is um, um, this is very interesting because um, naturally. Uh, um, Oregon and Burgundy having climate which are not dissimilar, um, of course, you tend to uh, pay attention to the same things um, in Chardonnay also as, as in Pinot. And um, I was absolutely anxious um, uh, about uh, harvest because um, naturally it's critical for all grape varieties to harvest right at uh, uh, the right um, moment and to catch that moment. But with Chardonnay, it's absolutely critical. Uh, and uh, Chardonnay can really be surprising. So I have been um, saying uh, to uh, Tracy, and, and I was much more stressed than she was, watch, 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 uh, monitor the Chardonnay, how's the Chardonnay doing? and uh, what's the color of the grapes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And actually, I think we were lucky with the, the fact that this, uh, this season, this vintage 18 allowed for a very progressive and slow ripening. And we have a, a, an indication which actually was also repeated in 19 that this site, the Bishop Creek site, the fact that we are at the top of the hill, quite windy, is not necessarily an early uh, uh, ripening site and is not a site that is very warm, which I think is really good for Chardonnay. Both very well for the future because I haven't seen these um, in these two seasons, this, this, this extremely quick ripening that is a bit dangerous with, uh, with Chardonnay. Yeah. So uh, talking, and I know, uh, it, it, what you said about the 18 is is true in terms of, of the richness and, and that balance, that sort of tension as you're talking about between the, the richness of the fruit. But many of you have these wines in front of you. And uh, I, I, again, I apologize, Jean Nicola. I understand it's difficult, but um, I do have them in front of me as well. And so if you, any of you have any comments about the wines or questions about how the wines are tasting, then go ahead and put it up in the, in the chat room and, and we can sort of talk about it. But what you speak of in terms of the 18 is in fact very true. This is the affinity that, that I'm, 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 I'm tasting here, which again is a blend between uh, some uh, Bishop Creek fruit and then some fruit that we actually purchased uh, and, and blended together with it. And um, it is tasting really lovely and the vintage is incredible. The 17 on the other hand, or not on the other hand, is different but um, what I would say is it, it, it's much more mineral uh, driven. It, it is it, much more acidity. I think it needs more time. Um, this wine will definitely open up over time. In fact, even today, you know, an hour from now, as it warms up and opens up, it'll take on more. But it is really, really terrific and not 
certainly um, to be confused immediately with um, the sort of classic California Chardonnay in any way, shape, or form. Um, I know your opinion on, on that, Jean Nicola. And uh, we certainly, uh, in 2017, our first effort went to the far left when it comes to uh, rightness. And uh, I mean, we're certainly closer to austere than we are to yes. uh, oaky and flabby, which is exactly where we want to be. I mean, stylistically, you and I have very similar ideas about what mm. kind of Chardonnay we like to drink. Mm. Yes. No, I, I um, Jay is referring to uh, the fact that uh, I consider some California Chardonnays, not all of them, of course, and I, I can think of many of them which are very good, but some California Chardonnay are count among the worst wines on the planet, in my opinion. And uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, that uh, 15 to 16 percent overroped uh, kind of wine. This is exactly what we don't want to do. Uh, uh, and this is awful. Uh, but granted, you know, I'm not generalizing. Uh, there are some very good California Chardonnay. And if some people like that style of wine, good for them. But I don't. Um, anyway, it's, right. so, um, hang on. It, let me get some, we have some input from some folks and then we can move to France, but uh, the comment uh, was this, love the 17 leans towards Chablis. I would agree with that comment. Um, I'm going to drink the rest of the Chardonnay with goat cheese, fingerling potatoes and asparagus pizza. The only crazy. question I would have is where do you live? Um, and and we'll, we'll, we'll join. That sounds great. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, uh, Anyways, I uh, enjoy these wines, and Jonathan did want me to mention that you can the affinite. In fact, both these wines, I believe, are going to be available. You're going to get some an opportunity to to buy these wines, even though they're not released um, at the either end of this webinar or tomorrow, or I don't. Know, I'm not really exactly sure, but be on the lookout for it because if you want to, you will be able to. If you don't have these or if you only got the one bottle tasting, then by all means, you'll be able to do it. And again, there's only 55 cases of the, the 17 Chardonnay and there's 100 cases of the Affinity. So it's pretty, pretty small quantities. Shall right. we move on to Burgundy? Well, I wanted to, yes, uh, we should certainly move to Burgundy, but I wanted to um, explain how Chardonnay is made. Because um, it's, it's interesting, you know, it's, it's my perception of, of Chardonnay. And of course, it's a perception from someone who started making Pinot Noir red wine and then moved uh, to Chardonnay, and uh, now we're making a sizable amount at Meo Camusé. Uh, of course, there is the Closa Filibert. I buy some fruit also from other uh, appellations just to uh, see how uh, we do with these, uh, with more classic uh, uh, appellations like Meursault or, um, or Carton Charlemagne. But um, it's, I think Chardonnay is very interesting because it's, it's very challenging, I, I, I think. And um, people who um, actually uh, do Chardonnay as the main grape say that, uh, you know, reds are more complicated. I, I don't know. Um, both are, have their complications. With Chardonnay, um, you do not do any maceration. Uh, shockingly, Chardonnay is a white grape. Uh, uh, Pinot Noir is a red grape. Uh, but it has uh, white juice. So to acquire the color in, uh, in, red, uh, in red grapes, and this is true of 95 or 98% of uh, red grapes, uh, you have to do that maceration in vats for uh, two weeks, three weeks, etc. And then once it's done, you go to the press. With Chardonnay and with white wines, you go to the press immediately. Uh, and the fermentation is done with the juice. I mean, there is no skins unless you do some orange wine, which are quite, uh, uh, quite in fashion right now, but generally the maceration and even in orange wine is, 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 is not uh, very long. So you go to, you go to press, um, and of course the uh, manage, uh, management of the press is really critical. 
Then you go to sedimentation and uh, the management of the sedimentation is critical. Uh, and then you go uh, to barrel and then the fermentation starts. But actually the fermentation in itself is, of course you have to manage temperature, but it's not extremely important as um, the, the, the fermentation for, uh, for red grapes because for red grapes, you, you take a decision every day or several times a day. But for, for, for white wines, you have to monitor, but you don't really have an influence. What happened before is more important. So my point is that actually you have very little time to decide when you do uh, when you do Chardonnay. And of course, you have to picture yourself that you are in harvest and in the middle of harvest, you have to do uh, the wine. In 48 hours, you harvest and 48 hours later, I would say that, of course, some, some people might disagree, but I would say that 70% of your vinification job is done. So this is, this is technical and really challenging in my opinion. Yeah, well, that was the thing that, that you know, the novice here, who, of course, uh, Tracy uh, and, and, and John Nicola have experienced at this for many years, but this was the first time I was ever involved in making white wine, was 2017. And when I really fully realized, I, I remember looking at Tracy and, and, and talking to you, and we're going like, so basically the decisions we make, both in terms of pick it, when we pick it, which, of course, is crucial on the red the red side as well. So I don't want to minimize that. But once we pick it, as you say, like 48 hours later, you're done. I mean, I mean, you basically lost your ability to influence that wine to a great extent. Now you can do some things in terms of the winemaking and fermentation and so forth, but basically everything you do in those 48 hours, that's it. And, and you, have, you have sort of set in stone what that vintage is going to be. So it's extremely nerve wracking. I mean, I, I didn't, I'm glad you didn't tell me ahead of time. <laughs> yes, that's true. So it's, um, it was starting with the, uh, and moving to, to Burgundy and starting with the, with the Clos Saint-Philibert. Clos Saint-Philibert is, um, is a family site that is in the Haute Côte, that is above the village of uh, uh, mont this is, uh, yeah, we should have seen this photo before, but this is nice, uh, yes. This is Clos Saint-Philibert. So you see that it's actually above, on top of the hill, overlooking uh, the flatland and towards the Sohn River, which is about 20 kilometers in the direction of these rows. And um, very high on the hill, close to the uh, 400 meter uh, boundary. Um, so it is a very specific site. Um, it's high, it's very stony, um, and um, starting uh, to make white wine with uh, that site was, was a bit challenging because I had first to learn how to make white wine, and this is quite different as I explained from red wine, and also to master, uh, to master the site. Um, so Jean Nicola, the site was also in itself just from a, uh, a agriculture standpoint was very challenging. Uh, you may remember I one of the first trips when I came to visit you after we met in Pennsylvania. We you you said, oh, I, I got to go up to to this vineyard that I planted, and I went up with you there, and um, we walked. This is what nineteen ninety. Two? 1990 was planted. We started the planting in 1990. So this maybe was a year later or maybe two years later because mm -hmm. you were absolutely scared shitless that this thing was going to die. Basically, you were not at all excited about what was happening. And I was looking at that. The, the stone, you see that in that photo, the stoniness, it's almost like Vaux Telegraph in, 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 in the Rhone where it's like completely stony. And I'm thinking, how is this stuff going to grow here? I mean, it was a very, very challenging site from just in terms of a planting and getting it to grow standpoint. Absolutely. And it is still challenging. It is still challenging, and uh, uh, we, uh, we it's still uh, you know not uh, the uh, generous soils of uh, uh, Marceau or elsewhere. It is it is very challenging uh, as a site, and um, in general we have a um, 
relatively low crop. Chardonnay is um, in general a, a quite a generous a grape variety and um, this is one of the things that is uh, counterintuitive for a red wine producer. It's, um, of course, you don't necessarily want to overcrop and have a big crop, but in general, it's uh, more tolerant to, um, to higher yields. Um, naturally, um, you should not, you should watch it and uh, we'll make a green harvest if we have to. Uh, but um, with um, uh, with Clos Saint Philibert, it rarely happens. Really rarely. Um, almost never perform a, uh, a green harvesting, whereas it's uh, almost systematic. Sometimes light, but systematic with the uh, with the Pinot Noir. Um, so it's it's one of the big uh, differences, and. Uh, so this, this, this wine is um, quite interesting because for me, I've, um, you know, uh, it now has, uh, we found a balance, we found a way to express the, 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 the character. And uh, I think it, to describe it um, with images, I think this is a, a kind of cross between Chablis and Marceau. It has uh, the leanness and the acidity of, uh, of Chablis and the, the, of, uh, naturally the minerality, not the same kind of minerality, but the mineral character uh, from Chablis. And it has, it, it's a little bit more generous and uh, is done a bit more in the so far, uh, uh, perhaps a little bit more viscosity at the beginning of the mouth uh, compared to, uh, to Chablis. But this is, you know, due to the site, this is a, uh, uh, how I describe the wine and how I describe its uh, its, its character, which is uh, which is very special, and uh, lots of freshness, lots of acidity, and we need to really harvest very ripe so that we have a good balance between the natural acidity of the wine, um, and so that the wine is not too severe. We need really to have a, 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 an extremely high. Uh, uh, maturity. In general, it doesn't really go up in alcohol. Uh, so with 13% uh, alcohol, we have a very good uh, ripeness with that, uh, with that wine. And this is generally what I aim at. Yeah, and I'm having drank this wine now since, uh, you know, every year, basically, or at least most years, I've been fortunate enough to drink this wine. Um, it, it really reflects that photo. I mean, that photo of that vineyard tells a thousand words. It, the acidity that jean Nicolas is talking about, it, it's so interesting because that acidity is going to be there anyway, right? So the reason why you have to have that ripeness is, as you say, you have to get that balance. And I find uh, with these wines, the Clos St. Philibert, which incidentally, doing a plug for my friend here, this is the best bargain in Burgundy. And uh, I went on Wine Searcher, whatever it was, two days ago. I was searching for it, trying to tell some friends who were interested in buying a, a bottle to be able to have it for the tasting uh, today. But it's, you know, it's like 40 bucks, 50 bucks, something like that, depending on where you're buying it and the vintage and this and that and the other. And unlike most of the other Mayo wines, you can usually find it upon release. I mean, there's enough of it made and enough of it makes it into America that you can, you can actually find it. Um, and it is the best value. It is such a great wine for that, for that price. But it's not particularly good the first couple of years. It's so acidic. I mean, I find it to be like kind of enamel, taking off your teeth kind of acidic for the first year or two. I mean, it's just like, whoa. But boy, if you have the patience to give that, that, those wines, and obviously it varies from vintage to vintage, but, but for the most part, if you give those wines you know, four or five years, I've even had a bottle that I forgot about or something and was 10 years old and, and had it and it is fantastic. I mean, an absolute wine that you want to bring to a tasting of much quote unquote higher, uh, loftier white burgundies mm -hmm. and it'll blow it away. I mean, really, really a great wine. No, it does reward, um, it does re reward aging. Uh, I think that my two best vintages in terms of uh, how they aged was where uh, 07 and 08 
um, 07 uh, because it was a really great Chardonnay uh, vintage in, uh, in Burgundy, uh, early, ripe, but uh, having a lot of uh, having a lot of acidity. So that was a great complement um, and a great uh, combination in Burgundy in 07. And 08, uh, surprisingly extremely acidic uh, vintage, but uh, the Clos Saint-Philibert actually was, was, was quite austere at the beginning, but really evolved extremely well. Uh, and I have a, a, a few man magnums left, which I've been, uh, drinking over the past uh, 12 to 18 months and really good, really good. I've enjoyed them. Um, in case some people wonder, I'm drinking the uh, 2015 um, tonight and uh, I'm very pleased with it. It's ripe, uh, but it has uh, also, um, like all close and a very good acidity, which provides a great backbone. And I'm pleased to say that the family appreciated it uh, tonight. I got compliments from uh, Natalie, I got compliments from my uh, from my kids, and uh, you know oh, that, uh, this is uh, yeah this rarely happens. So it I'm uh, happen every day. <laughs> Although I did notice Natalie was complaining you drank most of the bottles, so they were complaining about that. But I mean, yes, we have to fight you off. Um, a few questions and some other comments. Um, the uh, there was a comment about the 2013 Close Saint Philibert and uh, how they were drinking that it was quite rich on the nose and palate, even tropical but with plenty of acidity. Uh, Mark uh, mentioned that the best Close Saint Philibert he had was the 2013. There, so there's another comment about the 2013. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see what else is in here. There's a couple questions. Um, one is that uh, there's a question asked to whether or not. We kept any of the, where is that question? Have you kept any of the old vine Pinot Gris? And the answer is uh, yes, not a lot, but uh, it's what, 0.15 of an acre. And we, usually, we, we blend that together with some Chardonnay and uh, sell that out of the tasting room. I think we had I don't know, 40 cases last year or 35 cases. So if you're interested in that, yeah. you should text or respond to Jonathan's uh, a link there and ask him for some of that. But there is a Chardonnay Pinot Gris blend that we make a very, very small amount of. And we have that there and it's, it is old vines. Those vines were planted in... The late 90s, I think. Was it late, the ones at the bottom? The very, very bottom? Mm -hmm. Those mm -hmm. were I thought they were older than that, but you might be right. You might be right. Um, okay. Some other questions that, that came in was, um, did we have Chablis in mind when making the 2017? Did, I'm sorry, did we have? Did we have Chablis in mind when we oh, okay. made the 2017 Chardonnay? No, no, not necessarily, but I think that we, uh, I was assuming uh, perhaps that the site uh, was going to be a bit uh, uh, riper and or, or ripen, would ripen earlier than uh, it actually did. And I think that now, of course, it's still too, too early, um, still too early three years, but I think that now we can be reassured that this is not the case and, uh, and leave, uh, and, I would not say leave the Chardonnay alone because arguably 17, 18, and 19 in Argon were uh, three vintages where ripening was progressive. Um, so uh, not a big pressure of, uh, of heat. But uh, we can assume that this is, uh, this is not a necessarily a site uh, that will uh, uh, ripe overnight. And again, this is really a danger with, uh, with Chardonnay. And, um, you know, it's, it's uh, a lot of my colleagues in Burgundy uh, are concerned uh, with, with this because it, it, it can happen, really, they, they, uh, it can happen. And I've tasted a number of, uh, of Chardonnay, which are, you know, a little bit worrying in some cases because this is, you know, it lacks, um, looks like a lot of uh, sweetened water. Actually, it's not very uh, very appealing, but it lacks really zip and black backbone, 
and uh, if you lose that 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 structure, because you, of course you have no tenants in white wine, if you lose that that structure, it uh, makes uh, Chardonnay very uh, very very dull, in my uh, in my opinion. Uh, Jean Nicolas, we have a question about if there's any difference in the winemaking techniques between the wine, uh, the Clos Saint Philibert in Burgundy and the Bishop Creek and uh, an Affinity Chardonnay that we made in Oregon. Well, not really. We have uh, um, so seventeen was uh, was the beginning was a bit special, but since uh, eighteen we have the same type of press because press is absolutely critical exactly. in making uh, the, the Chardonnay. We have the same type of press in uh, Burgundy and Oregon, so we are able to execute the same press program in both uh, in both regions and the same the same routine, so to speak. Um, so it's um, it would be very much the same uh, the same canvas. Um, the um, um, the oak treatment I think that is is very similar too in the sense that um, you have to pay attention uh, and be cautious with oak in, in white wine because I think it, it stands the oak le much less than the uh, than the, the red wine. So um, I to this talk, is, talk about what our oak treatment because there's not it's not there's no real new oak. I mean we we fermented in neutral oak, but there's not. Yes. There was another question about the stainless steel and so forth. Why don't you talk about what we do? Yes, I think that uh, it is still important to um, to vinify in uh, in oak and have uh, accomplished the fermentation in oak. Um, I think it's. it's Yes, it's, it's really nice to have these uh, small containers and uh, be able to work with the lees and uh, manage a little bit the oxygen too. But uh, yes, new oak, uh, we, uh, we wanted to be very cautious the first years with, uh, with new oak and uh, not uh, overwhelm the wine with, uh, with oak because it can, be, uh, it can really be a little bit uh, dangerous with, uh, with white wine and really overwhelming. And... Um, I, I guess it was not a reaction against uh, uh, against California, uh, but it was really a. We really wanted to be cautious and and see what the wine would uh, look and taste like before, perhaps and perhaps with Bishop Creek in the next few years, maybe we'll introduce a little bit of new oak uh, and see how it's uh, it's uh, it changes and what influence it has on the wine. But uh, for the first years, we wanted to be very, very, very cautious. Uh, Clos Saint Philibert has a little bit of new oak, about 15% uh, of new oak, uh, which makes the wine arguably a little oaky, but um, it also helps with uh, development and the openness of uh, the wine. And this is a part of uh, the uh, winemaking that uh, balances the acidity in, uh, in Clos Saint Philibert but certainly no more than 15%. So we're um, getting close to our hour that we promised we're going to keep these in for you guys. Um, there have been a few more questions. One of the questions which leads into something that we had talked ahead of time we wanted to talk about is the influences. What are our influences in terms of Chardonnay and, 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 and what wines, you know, what, what wines are driving the sort of profile that we like? And, um, do you want to you want to talk about that first? Do you want me to go first? No, no, I, I can talk. And I've seen a question about batonnage. Uh, batonnage is stirring the lees. Um, what you have to understand is that Chardonnay is not naturally a very uh, aromatic grape variety. So the structure and the aromas come a lot from the lees. Uh, the, you know, the leftovers of the skins, the, the minuscule kind of particle in, inside the juice. And um, I think that, yes, like, like many people, we have, we're doing less patronage now than, uh, than, than before. And even with Clos Saint Philibert, um, as I guess, as um, the, um, uh, the, the ripeness uh, increased in over the past uh, 15, 20 years, we're uh, doing a little less patronage. So I would say three, four uh, in, in the course of uh, the élevage. And it's the same in Oregon. We do 
a few, but not too many, uh, because we think we don't need really the richness and an and, and increase in richness. Um, yes, so the influence, um, it's, um, of course, having all these great Chardonnays, uh, Chardonnay is really a fascinating uh, great variety, and having all these great Chardonnays uh, uh, just uh, next door was, was very exciting, and I've, uh, I have, uh, sh I'm showing from a, um, a distance, really a distance. Um, I'm showing a few wines. I have two bottles of uh, what we do with the Meursault, Meursault and Corton Charlemagne, but two bottles from other growers. And I'm not um, showing them very closely because I don't want anybody to touch them or take them from me because this is a Corton Charlemagne. Coche Durie and a Morachet from uh, DRC. So uh, these well, are my cool. treasures. <laughs> those are treasures indeed. <laughs> well, hope, are you drinking those tonight? No, no, no. I'm are just watching. Play? Are they off limits? I mean, <laughs> you're waiting until I come over. Yes, maybe, maybe when we are freed again, maybe that uh, that night. <laughs> Yes. Well, I got to say, you're obviously not, you're not practicing the if not now when uh, strategy in terms of selecting wine <laughs> from your cellar. But are you saying that your influences are DRC Montrachet and Coach Tari Corton Charlemagne? Okay. This is, right. this is my uh, Clos Saint Philippe is much better, of course. And uh, Affinité will be better, but. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Well, um, my story on influences is um, in 1985, I was in Paris on some, with some band or another, uh, or you know, pitching music to our distributor there. And I uh, got set up by Kermit Lynch to go visit uh, um, Francois Jobard. And uh, his son, Antoine Jobard, is making the wines now. You, you may see those wines around. But Francois was the guy who was making them at the time. And um, I went there uh, with my girlfriend at the time, uh, who became my wife, Allison. And um, we went and visited him. And it was just him. I mean, it was him. And then we went down into this cellar. And one of the things that I noticed was um, the, the aroma. I mean, it smelled kind of moldy, actually. I mean, you walked in, it was like walking, it was like, wow, this is, but very, very distinctive uh, aroma and, and, and smell. And he didn't speak any English, and my French is, is awful, if not non-existent, as jean Nicola and Natalie will attest. Um, and, and yet, and so we kind of just made it through, but I understood enough and, uh, and had enough wine terms that we got through and tasted a bunch of wines. And he opened up some old bottles and really fantastic in the sense that and these, much like the Closing Philibert wines, the, the Jobard wines were not particularly approachable at the beginning and, you know, first three, four, five years. But then as you got into it, this roundness and this lushness and complexity really came through. And he was gracious and, and, and tasted us through all these wines. And um, I then, from, from that point forward, I, I started buying those wines when I could afford them and bought them for many, many, many years. And literally to this day, when I pull out a bottle of Jobard, you smell the top of that cork and then crack that bottle open, it smells like his cellar. It's incredible, that exact same aroma. And it's almost like a childhood thing of bringing it back. But those wines um, are, for me, a really big influence in terms of the style that I like. Um, there's also a maker, um, which I would suggest to all of you as a, a, another good bargain, um, not as an incredible value as the Closing Philibert, but um, this guy, uh, the son now makes it, but Robert Denogent in uh, Mekon makes really amazing uh, Pouy Fousse for really, mm. not as cheap as they used to be. They used to be like 25 bucks and they were just a steal of a lifetime. And now I think they're 40 or 50. So kind of same price point as the Clos Saint Philibert, but are really amazing wines. And of course, you know, Costa Rica and Ravenau would be the other, I mean, Ravenau is the, 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 my favorite Chablis, but I, I, we're, we're making wine in Oregon. We're not making wine in, at least I'm not making wine in Burgundy. You are. So uh, those are just influences. But uh, Tracy and I talk about those all the time when we're, we're doing it. And we all talk about them. And um, 
I, I must tell you, I'm thrilled with how these wines have, have turned out. And opening up in the glass and see, reading your guys' comments, it's really uh, fantastic. And this is just the beginning. 17, there's a whopping 55 cases. Yes. We'll make more, yes. we promise. As yes. We, yes. As we yes, yes, yes. No, and, and just to um, add a word on, uh, on uh, the influence, it's, um, it's important because uh, we have now a climate that is arguably changing and warming up. And uh, therefore, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, people, vintners in Burgundy are a little worried. And uh, perhaps having uh, uh, tasted uh, the Chardon California Chardonnays I was talking about uh, earlier on are even more worried that the uh, that they wines end up like this. And as a consequence, there is a, a really a strong movement in, in Burgundy to keep the, the, the Chardonnay uh, 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 really fresh and, and vibrant and acidic. And sometimes these wines are a little austere. The, 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 the balance tilts a little bit, for my taste, a little bit too far on that, um, on, uh, on that side. And interestingly, uh, you see the same thing in, in, in Oregon. You see uh, there is a, a, a school of uh, vintners who uh, really want to uh, maintain that uh, uh, structure and acidity. And some of the wines are a little austere. What, um, what we really want is to, uh, to try to achieve the balance, really, and not necessarily lean towards that uh, austerity, not make it a, a really a signature. And uh, uh, if I, uh, you know, uh, show these bottles behind me, it's also because I like and I love the lushness of these wines. And, uh, uh, but of course, they should not be heavy. So it's, uh, it's the challenge of yeah. making Chardonnay lush and uh, having this uh, really this appeal on the mouth, but not heavy and having also the vib vibrancy and the kick in the, yeah, at the end of uh, uh, the tasting. Well, thank you all uh, for joining us. Um, we're going to put up a slide here at the end uh, with an invite to you guys of, for a, a, a tasting at uh, the Nicolas Jay estate. So you can take, take note of that. We'll put it up here at the end. But uh, thanks for coming into, into my house and coming into Jean Nicolas' house. And uh, it's very nice to have you. And uh, we appreciate, we had a number of people who are here back for a, a third time and a few who are back for a second time. Spread the word. We do have another tasting next Saturday. Uh, we're going to be going uh, back in age. We're going to be tasting the very first Nicolas Jay vintage 2014, and I have not, it's not been revealed to me what it is we're going to be drinking in terms of aged wine from Mayo Camise. So do you have an announcement or is this, is this a secret? Sorry, I'm already sleeping, Jay. Sorry. What did you say? No, what do you, what is the older vintage that you're drinking for our tasting next Saturday? I haven't decided yet. I need to, uh, to have uh, a family caucus to decide that. Okay, but at least you get to drink it during dinner and then have it. But at any rate, so next Saturday, same time, same channel. Um, we're also adding uh, some other uh, uh, other programs to this. We're adding, uh, I'm going to do one on music with uh, David Millman. Someone asked about the Sublime t-shirt. Uh, I don't have any more Sublime t-shirts, but but I, I do cherish the time mm -hmm. I spent with Brad uh, helping to make that record and and then obviously promote it uh, after his uh, horrible passing. Um, but David Millman and I are gonna do a talk uh, about wine and music. Uh, David Millman, who's the general manager at Domaine Duran and uh, ironically worked with me at IRS Records as our publicist. So we're gonna do one and uh, we're working on a series with some of the top sommeliers and chefs and we're gonna just keep having fun with this. So. We really appreciate your uh, joining us. And uh, Jean Nicola, would Great. you like to, I'll give you the, the final goodbye. Well, drink well today. Indeed, every day. Take care, everybody. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye bye.